Welcome to the latest in our series of 80 Shuko webinars. In today's webinar, we will discuss three award-winning projects from the 2022 Shuko Excellence Awards. In particular, we will look at how a carefully crafted facade system can not only improve the sustainability credentials of residential projects, but also ensure comfort and respond to context, as well as enrich a building's sense of place. We have three expert speakers who will each give a short presentation to explain their way of working and their approach for these award-winning schemes and help us set the scene for today's discussion. This is a topic that fits squarely into our culture and business principles at Shuko, where design excellence for facades is integral to our corporate policy and strategic focus. Facades often define a building. In light of the current climate emergency and energy crisis, good daylighting and energy performance remain critically important when it comes to facade design. The need, therefore, to adopt an integrated and collaborative approach focused on design and innovation cannot be overstated and sums up the spirit of the Shuko Excellence Awards. Thank you once again for joining us. I'll now pass you to Ruth, who's chairing today's event. Thank you, Sean. As you said, we are going to be hearing about three award-winning projects. Uh, they are, first of all, uh, Barbara Rice Architects, who will be talking about the Marlow in London, which is winner of the Refurbishment and Adaptive Reuse Award. Uh, then we'll hear from Squire and Partners, winner of the Residential Development Award, uh, talking about Luma King's Cross. And thirdly, we will hear from Neil McLaughlin Architects, which was winner of the Health, Education and Leisure Award for its Master's Field Development in Oxford. And this project is also the overall winner. So before I introduce our first speakers, I would just like to remind everybody that there will be a panel discussion question session at the end of the speeches and there will also be the opportunity to ask one or two questions after each presentation so please as any questions occur to you do please send them in because we love to actually address the questions that are concerning you uh, and with no more ado i will move on to our first project uh, which is actually going to be presented by two speakers from Barbara Weiss Architects, that is Barbara Weiss, and also her co-director, Carl Singpoor-Waller. And we're starting with Barbara. Barbara. Thank you. We are delighted to have been chosen not only as winners of the refurbishment and adaptive reuse category of the Shuka Awards, but also to present our project at this webinar organized by AT. The majority of Barbara Weiss Architects' work now spans spanning 35 long years of practice, involves refurbishing and extending existing London properties, many listed or in conservation areas. This has led to a strongly held belief that a successful refurbishment needs to be both subtle and sensitive to context, delivering buildings that have a strong continuity with the past, while managing at the same time to be spatially exciting, refined and totally appropriate to their new use. Refurbishment and reuse are also at the heart of our environmental beliefs. Demolition indeed should become an exception. In presenting our project, the Marlow, I will take you briefly through the history of the project, our approach to the client's brief and the architectural aspects we are most proud of. My co-director, Carl Singh Porwala, will then address some of the more technical aspects, including our choices regarding the treatment of the existing facade on Maryland High Street and the composite new facade that which opens onto our urban courtyard. To start with the background of the scheme, as you can see, the Marlow is made up of a, 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 quite a large number of different buildings. There are indeed seven buildings which have been uh, um, pushed together uh, into one entity over the past few years from different architectural periods. Uh, most of the buildings are mid or late Victorian, but uh, some are earlier. We have a Georgian house on an alleyway, and we also have a 1980s building on Blanford Street. So uh, there is no unity in the facade. The block 
opens onto Melbourne High Street. It's effectively half an urban block, and the main facade is on the on the High Street. Um, as was shown, uh, the building is above a plinth of uh, shops, and the, and these shops, when we first were approached, were incredibly higgledy piggledy and rather dilapidated. So one of our jobs was to give this elevation a whole new front. Um, the building was, the block, uh, the Marlow, was bought by the developer Dorrington in the 1980s. And for many years, they uh, sort of kept it in a, a variety of different uses, including rehearsal rooms for the Trinity School of Music. And in latter years, it became a rooming uh, house a very large rooming house, largely for American students who were in London for a couple of months and with lots of beds in very small bedrooms. So um, what suddenly triggered uh, the client to approach us? Well, most of you will be aware of the fact that Marylebone in the uh, 1990s was a very rundown, sad area. And Marylebone High Street had a number of uh, boarded up shops and quite a few charity shops. So it was definitely not uh, anything like uh, what it has become now. Um, the Howard de Walden estate, the owner of, uh, of the vast majority of properties in this area, uh, suddenly um, came up with this idea that time had come to gentrify um, Marylebone and to try and cash in with as much improvement uh, as, as was possible. And uh, they uh, put in place a whole uh, a new approach, which included um, a lot of refurbishment, but also curating very carefully uh, the kind of shop uh, that would be allowed to open on Marylebone High Street. And following this, uh, a couple of decades of this uh, strategy, uh, the values in this area shot up and um, uh, the type of, uh, of shops improved dramatically and everybody now wants to live in that area. It's become incredibly busy and incredibly popular. So our clients, uh, uh, wanted, of course, to be part of this uh, success story. Um, the in, very interesting thing in, that was done very carefully and well by the Howard de Walden estate was that they worked hard to retain the character, the architectural character, and just the general character of this area. And so um, that was part of our brief, was to, to come up with a new development that retained everything that was good about it before. So. Um, what was our brief? Um, so here you see the where the, the location of the block, and here you see uh, a view from one of our um, penthouse flats at the top. This is what the building used to look like on the inside, on the courtyard side. It was um, uh, containing a huge amount of um, plant from the shops below, and it was a real dumping ground. And um, uh, thoroughly unpleasant. There, at the back, you can see the the Georgian houses that form the third side. Um, so the brief of the client was to develop a, a rental development uh, that was therefore quite robust because it wasn't for sale; it was for rental, and that would appeal to a variety of tenants. Um, so uh, different age groups, different nationalities, and what was um, sort of the the signature. Uh, that they were looking for is that it should be a bit like a boutique hotel in central London. Um, and then there were also uh, caveats. We were told very clearly that any work we did was not to be disruptive to the shops below, which of course uh, is, is a very difficult thing to do when structure usually goes down to the lowest floor. So um, here you can see the plan of the of the block uh, before we uh, we uh, started working on it, and the issues that we were confronted with was uh, given that um, there were all these seven buildings, each one had different levels and different ceiling heights, and so there was a huge amount of internal steps uh, and very difficult to get room to more than one room on, uh, per floor without a step here or there, and then there were three entrances. Um, 
one of them was uh, about here on, on Blanford Street. The other one was next door for this building, which was a separate building. And then there was uh, a third entrance here. Um, and, we, and we were, of course, very keen on, on unifying the entrance and rationalizing the circulation. Uh, there was also only one lift, which was uh, somewhere around here. So this building was a walk up. This building was a walk up. And again, that wouldn't work very well with the boutique hotel um, approach because people with suitcases and so on um, and, and need to have easy access. Um, other, um, the, the, the structure was another big issue. Um, so um, we thought, what can we do with this, uh, with this uh, disparate configuration? And we came up with the idea of uh, creating a bit of a cloister circulation around a garden, an internal garden. Um, so there is a, we added an extra core. So there was a core here and we um, improved it dramatically. And then we introduced another core by adding a new volume. The red indicates uh, new, new construction. So you come up from the ground floor, either by lift or by through the stairs, and then you circulate along here uh, to the second core if you your flat is on this side or you go up directly if your flat is on this side. So there was a, there was a natural split. And in between the two cores, you get what we call the garden room, which is a communal space that opens out onto the uh, onto the onto this terrace. So this is the, the I called it the promenade uh, architectural. This is where you enter off the street. Um, uh, post boxes, the lift, the staircase, um, and then you come up to the garden room between the two cores and you start looking out onto greenery as opposed to looking out onto plant. And then this is the staircase in the second core, which is uh, quite an interesting shape. Um, and finally, this is the, the first view that I'm giving you of, of, of the garden, which is sort of the centerpiece. Uh, and you can see uh, how this building at the end has been liberated from all the plant that was encroaching on it. So this is another view of the garden. The garden is now uh, far greener than it was at this time. This was when it was first planted. And all the plant was put into this volume at the back. Our opportunities were to turn this uh, dumping ground into a found space, an oasis, and I must say it's very popular with anybody who visits, and then improving the circulation, but making use, for instance, of all those, um, making use of all the uh, uh, steps to add interest to the flats, uh, creating this, uh, this walkway, creating uh, various communal spaces in the hope that tenants would uh, start chatting and, and there would be a bit of a community in, in this oasis off the a very busy road. Um, and then we were also asked to furnish uh, 21 out of the 31 flats. And this was a very a great exercise because it allowed us to give a consistency of, of vision and, and of architectural style. Um, and so here I, I'm showing you um, uh, some of the flats and um, it must be said also that we're particularly proud of the fact that we've added 400 square meters to the building and this is part of the extra uh, volume that we added. Um, and this is a, there are two penthouses, which are the biggest flats in the in the building. This is one of them opening out onto a terrace. Um, and then uh, this shows you the, the the furniture, the language. We used a lot of sort of Bauhaus colors and, and posters and a lot of um, vintage furniture from the 1950s. And um, uh, I hate to say it, rip off. Uh, design icons. So it's a very designer interior. Um, you can see here how we use the steps um, uh, and, and then touches of luxury, including very generous showers and some stone. Um, so we feel that we've created uh, uh, a project that is, is very complex, but also very calm uh, and that it feels generous even though the flats uh, are, and then the flats are all male standards, but they are, they do feel more generous than they are. And then um, a lot of flats get terraces, which is a very nice feature in central London. 
And finally, the great news is that they rented almost immediately at top price. So our client was very happy with that aspect too. And I will now pass over to um, um, Carl who talk about different issues. Thanks again. Thanks, Barbara. And um, thank you to Architecture Today, Shuko, for, for giving us the opportunity to, to talk about uh, our project. As, as Barbara pointed out, um, We've been working on this for uh, a number of years now, and it uh, it really has been a, a labour of love, as such, in, in terms of uh, uh, the restoration, the readaptation, and and sort of the the reconstruction of 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 various components of uh, of this project overall. So, in terms of the facades here there were two very different strategies for the for the front and 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 rear facades you know as as barbara described there's uh where this building and buildings uh, is in the holly street conservation area and although the buildings weren't listed they were of uh of uh, a certain amount of merit as such and uh and retaining that 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 marlebone feel and the victorian uh, um, mansion blocks, uh, shall we say, style that came through was was an important aspect of 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 this area of London overall. Whereas the rear facades were uh, most of London, uh, they they tend to be forgotten spaces overall, which we which we took advantage of as as you uh, as you've already seen, and I'll go into a bit more detail with that. So that was the existing as it was in 2016-17, and. This is how it is now. And overall, you can see that the, the main difference to the to, to, to the high street facade is, is those retail units down the bottom. So, so as each unit, uh, the lease ended and, and it became available, we actually went in there, did all the enabling works that were required for the, the master plan of the residential above, put in new lift pits, uh, new um, structural works that were required for the for the residential project, and, and then reopened the the, the retail units. So, so you can see this. Um, uh, this was actually a stepped approach, starting on the on the right hand side with Louis Joe, and 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 we worked our way down. There's, a, there's actually a good stage by stage shot that we're, we're that we're putting uh, together now. But that's a Portland stone surround that 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 sort of unifies the whole the whole base of the scheme overall and uh, addresses. Um, uh, what we described as the the higgledy piggledy nature of um, of of the site, where when we when we actually received it. So, in terms of what we could do with this facade, or what we chose to do, well, it, it all started with a brick cleanup, and it, as a as there's a number of different age uh, Victorian uh, Edwardian buildings, there they were all in different states of repair. So we we started with a doff clean on the brickwork overall, and, and that cleaned up uh, uh, a lot of the muck and grime that had built up on it over years. But the the stone cornices up the top um, that required a, 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 a something a bit heavier, and we we relied on a cleaning method called torque cleaning, and that really got all that uh, soot and pollutants off of um, off the stone work as, as much as possible and brought those um, cornices back to back to life. But because it wasn't listed, um, we were able to look at and replace all of the timber windows on the on the, the outside of the facade. So it, we, we spent a long time finding the right uh, manufacturer and specification overall, and we settled on a manufacturer called Amodus, and they provided the, the sash and the, the casement windows um, across the development. And we, we went for a double glaze unit so for the improved thermal performance but we also included in that uh, uh, increased acoustic performance uh, across the uh, across the whole facade with the busy uh, noisy uh, high street sign one thing we were particularly uh, pleased with uh, we did a lot of research and development um, producing a invisible trickle vent over over all of these windows which use no plastic and so forth and you know, with very um uh very much an eye sourcing these plastic vents stuck normally on top of windows so the fact that they're invisible no plastic for uh, we're uh, very happy indeed um, that that's now a, a component um of these session casements overall so moving on to the the rear facade 
uh, Barbara had a, another photo of this rib sock. Here you can you can see this is very typical of the uh, the rear courtyard spaces in you know, in a city blocks in, in London, and it's a cheaper London stock yellow brick overall. And you can see it, it looks like far more than seven different buildings sort of uh, built on on top of one another, and and, and so forth. So so unifying uh, the the all of those buildings into one whole was 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 our primary task and this is what we uh what what the eventual scheme ended up as 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 we described uh the key to that was creating this garden space um where, for all the residents to use um and you'll notice that the big prominent feature in this photo is a red brick facade overall. So this contributed to the 400 squ additional square meters we put on there. And uh, a big component of that is the new uh, vertical and horizontal circulation, which really unlocked a lot of the floor plates internally for us. But um, getting red brick on the rear facade was actually uh, a bit of a task with the, with the planning officers and heritage officers, because it's not typical for the rear facades of, of these spaces in London. Um, and the argument we put across in a battle, Barbara, wealth or battle she won when we convinced him of this was, was now that we were creating such a, a, a social usable uh, space in the in this rear courtyard we were essentially bringing the the high street that, that the social side of 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 marlebone into these rear courtyards and using that justification to bring that red brick from the front to the rear um was was uh, i'm happy to say uh, enough to convince it of this so so where you have all these different uh, different buildings in there, different forms of massing you, know, you can see the the sort of still yellow stock on the on the right hand side we've got the red brick components and there's these green um uh, painted volumes as well that they've got there uh, you can also see the third ray uh, georgian townhouse uh, on the on the left hand side there there needs to be something that ties it all together and uh, we searched high and low uh, for the right type of window manufacturer that, 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 that could possibly deal with all these various components. And we thought very early on that and kind of bringing timber back here wasn't necessarily the right answer. And we landed on these um, steel profiles by, by Janssen Shuko. And um, you know, I don't want to turn this into a sales pitch overall, but there, there's a number of reasons why uh, that product was, was, was a great addition for, for this for this project here. So, you know, to start with, it, it's got uh, excellent thermal properties. Um, because it's a steel profile, it's got fantastic uh, sight lines and profiles overall. But as I go back to uh, the word I used a moment ago, which is versatile, you know, it, it's incredibly adaptable overall. As you can see, we've got a various different sizes of of window components. That's again a, a before and uh, after shot of the of the same rear facade. You can see we've reordered pieces uh, uh, there on the on the on the project. But we needed a product that could work as a very large casement size, uh, something that could potentially be used as AOV. So so having a casement that had an actuator or a chain drive that could still achieve a square meter free area overall, but also uh, something that belonged to a family of products that we could use for sliding doors, bifolding doors, uh, and so forth. And um, luckily, this um, uh, Janssen Art 2.0 profile, uh, uh, you know, ticked all those um, all those boxes for us. So. As we used it, we, we used it as part of the expression throughout the, the rear facades where we have uh, large uh, opening casements for the living spaces overall. We have these smaller punch throughs for the circulation spaces and then the large expanses of, of, of glass for um, the, the, the interaction spaces where, where you want to bring that new garden space in, in, into the building overall. Uh, so as we go up through the building, this uh, I've got a series of slides here which shows some of the terraces we've uh, incorporated into the scheme, and these are private terraces overall. So, so this one here at high level actually uh, uh, utilised a bifold door, um, 
you can see from uh, from from this balcony where we were very careful in making sure there was limited over overlooking between the the terrace spaces we had um this piece here that has a that has a bifold door to it this one is a is a pivoting opening uh door onto that terrace as well um so so being able to utilize all these various components but from the same family was 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 that thread that uh, that essentially ran through and unified all, uh, all the various buildings together for us so uh it's at this point that uh, you know one is supposed to talk about the the retrofit and uh, sustainability upgrades as such that we we incorporated into into the project that you know, I, I think for us, it, 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 everything that uh, both Barbara and I have described um, over this talk is lends itself to that. You know, uh, it's ingrained in all the moves we've made. The the upgrading of the fabric. Um, I mean, we haven't got into the mechanical systems and so forth, but the thermal upgrades and all of that contributes to this 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 unified whole. That that is um, that is this lovely. Um, retrofit and re-adaptation uh, project which is as i said at the beginning has, has has been a labor of love over the last five to seven years thank you certainly a labor of love and what a complex achievement um which some of our questioners have picked up on uh, i've got a question here di directed to carl saying can you elaborate on the cleaning processes used to bring the brick and facade back to its former glory the most important thing with the scaffolding that went up was was that the retail units down below carried on operation through the the christmas period and and so forth so the the doff cleaning that we employed is a it's a machine that, that that gets taken up onto the scaffolding and we had a facade cleaning specialist that came on um that were appointed by the main contractor Forcia, who was on this project and uh, we went through a process of of cleaning the red brick up in the first instance and we tried the doff clean on the on the cornices as well and that's when we realized that there wasn't cleaning away a hundred years worth of uh, soot and, and grime and pollution and so forth and that's when um, it was recommended that we try a torque clean and with all of these things you you must test it on an inconspicuous area and so forth and um, uh, luckily it, it made a it made a huge difference to to the cornices and and sort of brought them back to life and, and singing on the high street. And I think there's another question which actually relates to this as well, saying, are there examples of suds rainwater, or of rainwater harvesting, I think, and storing it on site, using it to clean the windows and facades? I'm guessing that answer to that question is no. <laughs> no, uh, we, we, we didn't do any rainwater harvesting on the project. Well, on, sorry, there was a there was a water butt. Um, so we worked with uh, uh, Joe Gibbons uh, for the landscaping, and we did uh -huh. collect water, uh, but it, I don't think it was specifically uh, used for one one function. Or, but we were certainly collecting water. That's interesting. I was just going to ask you, Barbara, quickly before we move on. Um, with all those different elements of the building, you know, there's an awful lot and it obviously works, but one could imagine a situation in which it became an unholy mess. Um, did you feel that using the same windows throughout was an important thing to do to actually unify that and, and pull it all together? So I, I completely agree. I think the, the main task was trying to um, find a way of ordering all these various elements we had and so introduce something that was quite strong and I hope the re-elevation conveys that you know the, the new red brick is is very simple and and, and sort of uh, trying to tie things together and likewise uh, the front elevation has the same windows and the rear elevation has the Shuka windows which are uh, totally in keeping with the slightly more modern look that we wanted to introduce uh, at the back. So uh, it was playing uh, order and, and disorder together and trying to benefit from the, the contrast between, between these two, two states. And I am delighted now to introduce our next speaker, who is Murray Levinson, who is a partner at Square and Partners.
Murray. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm here to um, give uh, a little bit of a story as to how um, this residential scheme <clears throat> as part of the King's Cross master plan uh, was uh, designed and developed um, and then um, perhaps in a bit more detail how uh, the delivery of the external appearance of the building uh, worked with um, our subcontractors. Um, you can see here uh, on this plan um, our plot which is called R3 sits um, in the sort of northern third of the um, uh, of the King's Cross um, Argent and related master plan um, and we're sandwiched between um, R1 and R5. Um, the, the plot itself is quite um, quite interesting actually because because um, unusually there there is not no particular front or back we we, we have a, uh, a facade facing west onto the large Cubit Park, um, but it also the site benefits um, from this sort of courtyard uh, view to the east. So that was always that was an, an immediately interesting uh, opportunity for us to um, consider how the elevations would respond to uh, to the character of those spaces. Um, and in terms of orientation, east-west um, is great uh, for our um, use, which is um, residential. The um, the actual footprint of the um, site was actually quite narrow um, and we tested out a number of different scenarios. These are sort of plan diagrams to show how cores and flat layouts might work. But because the, um, uh, the footprint was quite narrow, it actually drove us to um, justifiably deliver completely through units from front to back, which um, is actually always what one is hoping to, uh, to achieve. In terms of um, the sort of scale, mass and bulk of, of the plot, the, the, the Allies and Morrison master plan um, defined uh, here, you can see this diagram in the middle on the left hand side here where my cursor is, um, defined the, the, the width and height that the block might, uh, might meet. We actually challenged that with them and developed this, um, this step profile, which was eventually accepted. Um, <clears throat> in, the, in the brief that Argent uh, sent us. Um, they were really very keen. Um, you can see on the left hand side in this image that um, to the right of us actually was a, a block that fundamentally was made of a white material and to the left of us um, a much darker brown brick building and we were sandwiched in between and <clears throat> their their aspiration was that somehow our, um, our design uh, was a happy marriage of the two. So um, <clears throat> our excuse me, our thought process uh, was that perhaps we wouldn't necessarily borrow directly from the material, but more the colour and the tone of the two materials either side of us um, in the development of our of, of our facade. And we had um, uh, used the, the this sort of light stone, limestone colour material in many of our schemes uh, previously. We were comfortable with using it, um, uh, c contrasting against a much darker metal bronze coloured <coughs> finish. Um, kind of sort of reflecting the darker brickwork. Um, in addition uh, to that, we were kind of, we were also developing ideas that perhaps uh, the metalwork changed its colour or its tone as the floors rose, um, uh, getting uh, lighter um, uh, as as the number of floors rose up to add a little bit more variety and interest um, to the facade. Uh, in relation to the to the section, also we were trying something new, which Argent very much bought into right from the start, which was to um, kind of interlock flats which had this um, rather generously high living space of, of a floor and a half almost. So on the left hand side, you can see the diagram that <clears throat> in a large proportion of the building um, to one side uh, of the plan, there are three floors and to the other side, there are two. Uh, and it's where those two spaces are, our living rooms produces a really um, generous floor to ceiling height and it produces an interesting pattern um, on the elevation um, which is really the idea behind providing some something interesting visually to look at which you see um, <clears throat> you know in the final uh, photographs here. Then in plan form um, uh, that we, we were also sort of taking our cue a little bit um, from from the geometry of, of surrounding uh, buildings and we're looking at these quite um, angular uh, recesses and projections 
um, that could form the balcony space um, and could form the uh, the line of the external glazing. Again, adding a little bit of interest um, to the facade and making a reference to the orientation, i.e. the sun path, um, maximizing the outlook um, in that direction. Down at the ground floor, um, there's a large central uh, reception area. Uh, one would split left or right to go <coughs> up into the cores. Each half of the building has its own core. Uh, and we had these little colonnades which soften how the building comes down to the ground, providing as much pedestrian connection, linking Cubit Park um, to the Jellicoe Gardens um, to the east. And on the typical plan here, you can see we've we've maximizing the number of uh, three bedroom units um, uh, with this interesting section as I've um, described before. And here is here's the, how that's illustrated in section here, bedrooms to the rear, um, sorry, bedrooms facing the Jellicoe Gardens to the east, single storey, and then this larger living room facing Cubit Park, and then interlocking with this one, which is the larger flat, the two bedroom um, unit, um, with the stairs connecting bedrooms to that living room space. Another benefit of this step section, um, we felt was that one of the roofs could be completely um, used for communal terraces. Uh, one's always dealing with putting plant on the top of the building. And if you can separate plant from terrace space as much as possible, that's always a benefit. Um, th these are the uh, illustrations that um, went, went in for the planning, which kind of conclude all of the um, <clears throat> design principles that I've, I've just been discussing. And, and you'll begin to see here, um, now talking about the, the metalwork um, uh, veil, um, that third element, we talked about the, uh, the white um, limestone, which is actually a precast material. We talked about the bronze metalwork um, and the glazing. <clears throat> and this, this sort of lightweight veil was another idea, a sort of third element that came into play to give some richness to the facade. Um, and the pattern that that, um, uh, you know, was, was um, influenced by, by two things. One, this kind of green and nature idea because of the setting of our building sandwiched between two um, pieces of green uh, space and a little bit uh, of the historic reference that the site obviously sat on the top of uh, quite significant, uh, you know, goods yard in King's Cross. And maybe we could reflect that history somehow in the elevation of the design um, and through a pattern development, which um, related to the train tracks, trying to merge this idea of quite geometric train tracks with nature, perhaps a little bit obscure, but that was quite an interesting challenge. And these are sort of early ideas of um, uh, morphing those two um, things together. And, and we always had this idea that these sort of perforated metal screens would cast these fabulous shadows internally during the daytime, and then at nighttime would have that kind of illuminated quality that you see uh, uh, in, some of these, uh, in some of these images. And so the pattern began to, uh, to emerge. Um, it was a sort of perforated laser water jet cut um, aluminium sheet. Um, and that evolved in our work with subcontractors to full scale mock-ups and through that process the design evolved and changed the thickness of material the amount of perforation um, was all a very uh, important um, step in the refinement of the refinement of the design um, and then here were some illustrations uh, which show perhaps these early ideas of how it might have looked like on the outside and importantly on the inside. <clears throat> and then finally, working with one-to-one um, -one mock ups for a full bay, showing the integration of the perforated sheet, sliding doors to predominantly living rooms with this kind of geometric balcony shape in front, uh, all coming together very successfully uh, in, our, in our opinion. Um, <clears throat> and that pattern had to work not only for the um, for the double, or the height and a half living room, but also some of the flats you'll see, you saw um, were only single storey. So we had to have a single storey <clears throat> version of that. Um, coming down to the ground, um, that important kind of pattern that made a reference to the history of the site needed to, uh, you know, be right up close, we thought, to, to your engagement of the building at the ground floor. Um, and eventually the design evolved here to a sort of more solid um, version of it. Um, 
uh, for the entrance into the reception area. But once into the reception area, working with um, uh, the interior designers, we uh, bled that theme uh, to sort of reinforce the brand of the building um, and uh, uh, you know make, make it feel a little bit more authentic on the site. Um, I mentioned um, the other smaller courtyard garden, um, the Jellicoe Gardens to the east. Um, so uh, the the pattern was again similarly evolved for for that elevation. Um, th this elevation primarily, as you'll remember from the plan, um, contains bedrooms, so we didn't really need that huge amount of, of open glazing. So the solid panels uh, in this case reflected a similar, more um, solid interpretation of the open mesh um, that you saw um, facing west. There's some illustrations um, of how that evolved. Um, and similarly, the pattern was reinterpreted again, just in these small um, uh, cheeks here, uh, here is a, a panel, vertical panel on both north and south cheeks here, um, adding some interest into the flank walls. And you can see here <clears throat> the, the casting um, showing the pattern form, um, we think quite successfully. And then a final couple of slides just to uh, conclude um, how we have all worked together. I think, I hope everyone thinks it's a successful project um, uh, and, and does that, that really lovely um, uh, thing that we always wanted of casting shadows um, internally uh, um, to the living spaces. Um, and then at night time, the contrast where one gets the glow from the inside. Thank you. I'm sure I'm not the only one having fantasies about living there. Um, could you tell us, Murray, how, how did you match the colour of the metal panels to the colour of the framing to the glazing? Was that tricky? Because obviously it was made by different people, wasn't it? Um, actually, I, d I don't think it, were, it, it was. It, it wasn't uh, entirely made by different people. There was one organisation that was essentially coordinating the two. Um, and uh, we um, spent quite a lot of time um, uh, choosing not only a range of colours, a, a palette, as I described in that presentation, of colours that varied as the buildings rose, uh, but but to make sure that um, the uh, th through a series of samples, essentially that um, that the uh, the finish to the uh, framework of the glazing matched the finish um, to the uh, to the aluminium, aluminium panels. So um, it, it is something that, to be honest, we've done quite a lot of before, and it actually, truthfully, it wasn't that difficult. Well, that's always good to hear. Um, as I said, I've got apartment envy, but um, those through building flats look absolutely fantastic. Um, I think half of the flats on every floor are actually single aspect. Um, did you have to think about those of the studio flats, as I understand it? Did you have to think carefully about how the ventilation worked in those? Um... Well, I mean, obviously, we were trying to maximise the amount of uh, through aspect units um, in the floor plate, um, maximise the number as much as possible. Um, ideally, we would have loved for, for, for them all to have been through aspect flats. However, the number of cores that one would needed to have provided would have made the floor plate inefficient. So we had to um, uh, manage some single aspect units with a number of through aspect units. Um, the benefit of the orientation of the site being east-west means, of course, that none of those units are actually north facing. So they all get good daylight. Um, they all get good ventilation because the size of the windows uh, were, were really generous, um, big sliding windows. Um, and, um, uh, and therefore, as single aspect units, um, they do the, the best that one could, um, either facing east um, uh, and certainly the west facing ones um, get a terrific outlook across quite a large park. We will have a chance to talk more about this project, uh, to talk about all the projects during our panel discussion. So everyone, please do keep sending your questions in. Uh, but before we get to that discussion, uh, we have our final presentation, uh, and that is from Holly, Holly Galbraith, who is an associate with Neil McLaughlin Architects. Holly, over to you. Um, so I'll start with one of my favourite images of the project. Um, 
This is taken by Nick Kane and it's a view through one of the brick undercross uh, towards one of the student accommodation buildings. I think it captures the essence of the scheme, which is this serene inner world um, of the academic scholar. This is a project about buildings set within landscapes. Um, and this image sort of captures that, I think, beautifully. We'll also situate the project just in wider Oxford and also in relation to some of the other projects our office has done in, in Oxford. Um, the Masters Field Development for Balliol College sits at the eastern edge of Oxford's sort of civic core, which is here. Balliol's main quad um, and main, main college site uh, is located here along Broad Street. Um, it's sort of further east um, of the city than some of our other projects um, that are labelled um, around here. Projects in beige or other developments that are uh, under, under development or under construction at the moment. Um, it's interesting to sort of note its location geographically in Oxford because you can pick up here the change in grain of the city um, from the sort of formation of the historic quads, um, these enclosed wall gardens, um, to the more suburban um, historic terraces of the domestic villas to the south, and then moving northwards around um, the Arc of St. Cross Road, you move into the larger scale volumes of the university parks and the science developments. Arnie Jacobson, St. Catherine's College is towards the end of Manor Road here further east of the site. The project itself is predominantly student accommodation. Uh, there's 225 rooms provided across eight um, buildings and they're configured around the eastern arc of a cricket pitch which is called the Masters Field where the project takes its name. Within um, this building here on the southeast of the site, there's also a three bedroom professorial flat uh, for a visiting Eastman professor and American scholar um, who occupies a residency at the college annually, um, taking the room count to 228. We've also got a pavilion located at the centre of the site that houses um, a squash court, um, changing facilities for the recreational pitches um, and also a hall for cricket spectation. The plan also depicts a future phase of development, which is an assembly hall that's anchored on this corner between St. Cross Road and Manor Road here. Um, the plan locates the buildings, I guess, uh, joining an ensemble of existing student accommodation buildings by MJP, McCormack, Jameson, Pritchard, an image of that is just at the bottom left of the screen here. These buildings were completed sort of late 90s and early 2000s. And we complete the enclave of student accommodation blocks here with the first building, building A, um, on the corner of the site. Around the arc of St. Cross Road, we also, um, in the context uh, of listed buildings, grade one listed church, St. Cross Church, which houses Balliol College archives, and then a law library by Sir Leslie Martin, grade two star listed, which you can see at the north, the north of the plan here. And the project, I guess, had to mediate, I guess, a shift in scale. Um, across the site from these sort of smaller domestic uh, historic terraces at Longwall and Hollywell, um, along to the larger institutional scale, um, which begins at the north, sort of starting with the Leslie Martin Law Library. And this project, I guess, also is about framing street edges. This is a view along Jowett Walk uh, towards St. Cross Road and also scaling the buildings comfortably within this historic context. We're stood at the south of St. Cross Road here, looking north. The buildings here are scaled at three storeys um, to reflect the proportions of the historic villas adjacent and also the suburban um, domestic villas that are occupying the centre of the site. Here, where the buildings sort of sit within a suburban context, we set the buildings back from the street beyond walled, walled gardens. As we transition to the north of the site, the institutional scale is realised by elevating the buildings up on brick. Uh, masonry podiums. We've also raked every third course of the brickwork joint here that mimics the law library for those of you who are familiar with it on the opposite side of the road. This uh, road is quite a busy uh, sort of arterial ring road around Oxford and we've elevated the study bedrooms here above the podium um, also to offer a degree of privacy for the occupants here from the um, proximity of the public realm. We've also enhanced the acoustic treatment of the windows and the trickle vents um, on these elevations. I think this image also captures um, one of the conversations we had early on with the planners and the conservation officers about how this building could sit within a settled sort of historic landscape and how we can look at staggering these gables along St. Cross Road if you're viewed south to frame some of these um, historic elements of the context here, um, the gable of the St. Cross Church. We looked extensively at um, the history of um, 
the landscape, I guess, and particularly that uh, St. Cross Road and Manor Road junction. You can see in the watercolours on the right hand side um, compared to the um, bottom left, which is a photo of the former um, site context, how the arc of the road changed. Originally, historically, you'd be able to read the full gable of St. Cross Church um, that was then skewed um, in the early 1900s, uh, obscured by a changing of the, the arc of the road. We wanted to more uh, better reveal um, that gable, as you could see on the on the former image in full. I think it's also just to prompt, uh, pick up actually that we were keen to take cues from history and sort of former buildings that occupied the site, in particular this medieval barn um, that once was part of an arrangement of gables that set up this sort of market square at the Manor Road Junction. Um, so when you bring all of those elements together, this is a sort of a scheme that's interested in forming street edges along the south, um, setting buildings back from gardens to mimic um, the domestic curtilage of the suburban villas in the centre of the site, and then also starting to increase the scale um, as we move into this sort of institutional world of the north of the site. You can also see here in plan how we start to stagger the gables of the buildings to the north to slip with the planes of um, the Leslie Law Library. Where that building recedes, we project a block forwards. Where it um, pushes out into the road, we recede the volumes and that also contributes to that staggering of gables setting up this relationship with the gables of St Cross Church and Hollywell Manor, the graduate terrace. We had an interesting challenge as to how we treat the corner and the arc of the site um, here um, and that's represented by this future phase of development which is the assembly hall yet to be built. We were looking here at changing, noting the different function from uh, student accommodation to a place of gathering, um, picking up on cues from, um, from history in that medieval barn we saw earlier. Interestingly, we discovered some of the footings of that medieval barn when we came to construct some of these buildings at the north. Um, posed interesting challenges on site for having to um, dance some of the piles around um, those historic footings. So here we're looking at setting up a gable that um, takes in the transition of the arc of the road um, from the street frontages around that subtle curve um, and then also begins to enter into dialogue with the gable of St Cross Church opposite. Here we also as well um, invite the public realm deep into the site creating a graduate terrace which is framed by some buildings that host uh, graduate accommodation to sort of mimic I guess what would have been uh, originally the sort of the market square um, when Oxford was a much smaller, um, smaller development. Here you can see that gable in conversation with the ensemble of gables around, um, around this enclave, and hopefully that will um, get built out in the near in the near future. I think it's also represented on this model here how the elevations on the street um, form the edges to the roads here, but on the inner world, we've got a much more smaller uniform gables that um, cascade around this edge of the, the cricket pavilion. Another key theme that we were interested in when looking at um, the civic scale of the development was introducing gaps between the buildings. Historically, I guess, um, in Oxford, um, quads are often quite introverted and in Cambridge, the courts um, are too. These are sort of walled, um, walled gardens um, reflecting, I guess, the introverted, uh, introverted nature of the private scholar here and reflecting the fact that we're slightly on the edge of the civic core and we're moving into the more open um, suburban world. We were keen to introduce sort of gaps between buildings um, creating these sort of aggregated volumes that would allow views from the public realm into this sort of private inner world without disrupting the privacy um, of the occupants on the site. We took cues from the promontories of the Jowett Walk buildings, these elevated courtyards that offer glimpses um, through into the um, cricket pitch from the from Jowett uh, Road. And here you have views like from the public realm into these private gardens and then the recreational facilities and the sporting facilities beyond. Here you've got the buildings set within these planted, these planted borders. And also the buildings by introducing gaps between each of the, the buildings, which we can do because the blocks are of quite a modest scale. We can also frame um, views into and out of the site as well, back towards these historic um, monuments and landscapes around the context. And at each of these gaps between the buildings, we've planted trees around the site, which will mature over time. 
um, also sort of taking cues from the village green and cricket greens that you find where the edge of the, um, the cricket perimeter um, is lined with, with mature trees. And at the centre of the site, we've got a single storey cricket pavilion, which is flanked by the student accommodation blocks. This is one of the early um, visuals prepared for planning. Cricket pavilion is a single storey volume elevated on a grass mound offering sort of Western views out across the cricket table. It's a simple volume and a simple schedule of accommodation in that we have a main hall um, that is west facing. Um, and then at the rear, the mechanics of the plan are held within these timberline cassettes. There's a servery, um, pot wash facility, core and uh, toilet facilities. And these are all sat um, within a sort of a canopy, an oversailing canopy, which is a sweet chestnut timber lattice that extends out um, along the north and south and to the west, um, providing a cover for sort of outdoor spectating of the cricket. From the main hall, uh, the large uh, sliding windows um, open fully out to connect the indoor hall to this outdoor covered um, viewing terrace um, and offer these panoramic views across, um, across the landscape. The hall itself has a really intricate timber lattice soffit uh, where we've stacked sweet chestnut um, timber beams in this lattice, um, lattice form and it's got integrated lighting within that. It's quite a complex geometry um, and a lot of work was undertaken with the structural engineers Smith and Warwick um, to make sure that the roof could transfer the loads, um, the structure of the lattice could transfer the roof loads down uh, through the timber columns. We were fortunate enough that Simon, the director of Smith and Warwick at the time, is a fellow of Cambridge University and students at Cambridge University undertook an exercise to stress test this timber. Um, we were really keen to understand the differential movement and the settlement of the timber um, when stacked and how to design um, some of the roof interface details to, um, to manage that. So my colleagues um, and some of the electrical engineers as well looking at how we could integrate um, the lighting um, through notches on the top of the beams without that being visible from from ground level. And ultimately, I guess the main hall um, is a multifunctional space for use um, by occupants on the site and the college. Um, and it's one of the principal gathering spaces on the site. And gathering, I think, and how we can create a place for this community that live as a slight annex to the main um, college grounds was something that underpinned the original brief for the project. Um, the college were really keen that we considered an architecture that could seek to mitigate social isolation. Um, and how would we go about doing that? They were really concerned that students would, after a hard day's study in the college or the library, retreat back to their room and never have any engagement with any of their peers. And how could we look to alleviate that um, through some of the, like, the early spatial intentions? We play a sort of student life. Um, we consider like social gathering at the heart of student life and place the students at this sort of social circle um, around a dining table in this instance. We then look to radiate um, rooms around this, creating clusters of rooms around this sort of central gathering space, and then took the principles of this radial arrangement and then arranged clusters in blocks and then ensembles of blocks and buildings around external gathering spaces, creating this sort of formation of the quad, um, quadrangle that we've seen in some of the earlier photographs. And we're really keen as well that we create interiors that are generous, um, well lit and promote this social interaction. So students like on their way back to their rooms have opportunities to meet some of their peers and their neighbours. We've created widenings in the centre of the plan um, to allow for this sort of cluster gathering. It also creates a sort of a recess threshold at the private um, entry into each of the study rooms. By having modest plans and this radial arrangement, we're able to maximise the amount of rooms that are dual, dual aspect, which is also sort of depicted here in one of the early sketches. When we scale that up, um, we then see we have this sort of necklace of clustering um, that continues around the site and all of the volumes. We maintain the gaps between buildings that offer those views back through the site at an urban scale. And as an interior scale, we offer views back out into the landscape um, through these glazed links of kitchens and uh, cores and also at the gables. So we have a series of gathering spaces um, to really enable the occupants to interact with each other. Uh, this is not just a, a development that's keen to maximise um, 
volumes of student bedrooms. It's about creating a place where these occupants can live, be rested and also interact with their peers. We have gathering at the scale of a cluster, a common room which is situated at all of the primary pedestrian entrances into the site. And also in the inner world of the scholar, this is an interior view of that professorial flat that we um, spoke about on the plan earlier. And these principles also translate into the, the interior study bedroom. This is an early visual of one of the student rooms here, depicting this dual aspect um, room overlooking sort of the main entrance to the river. And each of the rooms, we have a series of um, room layouts across the site for undergraduates and graduates, but they all contain a similar a suite of joinery. We have different configurations of desks, um, storage and shelving um, and, and bed sizes to suit a range of price points for the college, which was part of their brief, but also to suit a range of academic vocations. Um, we have scientists living on site, we have uh, literary scholars, um, and they were interested that we could offer a range of uh, room layouts. I think we have 14 in total um, to suit a range of a range of occupants. Generally, we each room uh, will contain a bench along the window, um, a bed that's tucked into an alcove um, beyond um, the woven panel, a desk, and then an ensuite um, bathroom within the sort of a dressing alcove. The corner rooms are anchored by a precast pier that's set at 45 degrees to the plan. This allows for a thinness of the pier when read internally, and then the depth to be read externally, um, receding the glazing line back um, from the nose of the pier to offer a degree of privacy uh, to the student in their room. So here we've got a pier that's about, I think, close to a meter in depth when on the oblique, um, the glazing line set back beyond this precast pier. Internally, um, this pier cascades away. So you read the thinness of that edge, you only receive, read the depth um, when perceived externally. This is one of Neil's early sketches of a student occupying one of these corner bedrooms that we uh, sort of rather crudely um, recreated on site. Uh, this is my colleague, Joanna, who was um, in charge of developing a lot of the joinery package. Um, please excuse the sort of the fading light and the fact we've not straightened the angles um, and the verticals here. This is a site photo. Um, and then externally, I guess each study bedroom uh, is articulated as a facade um, bay here. So each bedroom is held between two brick face precast piers. Um, and then windows are held um, between uh, a woven uh, precast uh, panel. I think if we consider as an office of early examples of enclosure, um, we might refer to the ideas of sort of screens and tapestries, these sort of hung lightweight elements uh, of wicker work that would later become walls um, that would act as sort of room dividers and elements of enclosure. So externally, um, this woven motif um, holds the windows between the two brick face precast piers, um, and internally it acts as a sort of spatial divider between an area of sleep and an area of study. Externally, um, this sort of idea of this tapestry and this wicker work is expressed literally with the woven motif. The panel recedes back from the vertical piers um, and whilst it's propping the large spans of the lintels, helping to transfer the gravity loads of the, um, the facade down to ground and stabilizing the facade and its in-plane, the fact that we've um, receded the panel and um, embellish this with a sort of a lightweight motif uh, makes the functionality of these um, these panels sort of ambiguous. We're interested in an office of this idea of weaving the warp and the weft and also sort of early Assyrian carvings and how they were um, used as motifs. Um, I thought we'd include some examples of other projects. Um, I think this may have also been a Shuko uh, award-winning project. This is the tapestry building in King's Cross. Here, lightweight baskets are held between precast um, piers um, that have a, a fluted motif um, along um, the panels. This was actually TechCrete. Um, the master's field development was with Thought Precast. The baskets um, forming balconies have this articulated floral motif and the piers here are embellished um, with a, a leaf and a fluting uh, decoration um, that changes along the, the vertical height of the column. Along a similar vein, we also um, took this idea of 
motifs and carvings to the Athletes Village in Stratford. This was a project that was initially um, developed as a festive statement for the Olympics housing athletes and then would later become student accommodation um, and private um, residences. Here we um, scanned um, an ancient frieze, um, 3D printed uh, that into uh, a mold, and then the negative was used to cast the facade panels that we just saw earlier. Um, the relief castings are based on um, an ancient frieze uh, and depict, I guess, a parade of athletes that are assembled for a festival. At the Masters Field Development, the basket weave takes its cues from Oxford, um, the frieze of the Ashmolean, uh, designed by Cockwell, who we also know was interested in the Hellenistic principles, um, of which some of those early origins of architecture um, are also derived. We worked with Thought Precast. Um, we work extensively with mock-ups um, and sample testing, um, both in the factory and then on site, to finesse some of the details of, um, of this facade work. We're really impressed with the quality of workmanship um, that they were able to deliver. We also advanced a mock-up um, of the facade um, bays early on in the construction process to show the college, I guess, and the client, um, the scale of these, um, these bays and the room. Um, here you can also see a peek um, into the CLT, the cost laminated tam uh, timber, which is the primary uh, structural frame. We enjoy as an office working with CLT um, for many reasons, but one I guess is that also you can realize some of these early spatial intentions very early in the build process. Here you can see that idea of um, arranging these buildings radially around an external gathering space come to life and see the buildings in relation to the MJP schemes as well um, along the south. And here you see the emergence of these generous corner uh, windows and rooms um, and the CLT just awaiting um, its dressing of the, of the precast panels. Slightly grainy photograph there from site. Um, these are the piers um, laid horizontally um, awaiting transportation to site. Each of the piers are three brick bays deep, about 665 in depth uh, here. They're, they're all load bearing, um, laterally restrained only back to the CLT. Um, by helping hand brackets, as you can see in this in this sectional detail. And the depth of the piers is such that when read on the oblique, like in this view here um, along St. Cross Road, the facades take on a very solid appearance. I guess the depth only revealing um, itself through the interplay of shadow and light on the facade. We're really interested in that and how that works. One of the early precedents was Grundvik's church and how Jensen Clint um, I guess explores the cobbled brickwork. You may, um, you'll all know it um, in Copenhagen. This blonde brick cobbled structure um, that allows the light to dance across the facade and the depth of these piers. And I guess the depth is only sort of revealing itself as you turn the corner. Um, you have the thinness of the nose of the pier tearing back to the windows. And we hope, I guess, over time that the project will take on a settled quality within this historic landscape, um, the blonde brickwork complementing um, its surroundings, both the, the stonework of the church and also the law library and the MJP scheme. And I'll finish here on um, a slide, I guess, that takes us back to considerations of these students set within their um, their individual room, but part of a wider um, sort of ensemble of buildings and community. You can see the buildings cascading here away around the cricket pitch. Thank you so much. It's really interesting to see things like uh, the view from outside and then how those piers disappear from the inside. Uh, there's a lot to talk about. Uh, before we move back to bring our other participants in, I just wanted to ask you quickly a couple of things. Um, one is, I love the consideration you've given to creating spaces for social interaction. Um, I just wonder, has the college or have you registered how those spaces are actually working in practice? Are they being used? Yeah, the clusters, I think, seem to be proving popular. We were fortunate that the development was built out in phases, um, such that phase one, which is the 
uh, quadrangle to the south was occupied whilst the construction of the north was still ongoing. So we had this sort of real time feedback from the students and the college um, as to how they were used. They were also occupied just prior to the commencement of the pandemic. So I guess the cluster formation then translated into bubbles um, and they gave sort of user flexibility in terms of extra space for students to do their studies, to do their dry cleaning, to host parties. I think there's still some balloons, bottles of rum um, in some of the windows um, in those smaller blocks. I think the college like recognized that at the time it was a real investment um, by them to, who bought into this spatial idea to sort of create this oversized circulation and give that sort of increased GIA and some student flexibility and the clusters, they say, you know, are inhabited year on year out by different students how they how they see fit but yeah it's lovely to see the students when you're back on site um using those spaces um yeah good and obviously you've made the most of the setting and it's kind of interesting that you are looking out over a cricket pitch i just wondered whether you had to make any uh particular provisions in your design for cricket balls yeah, certainly. I mean, we were lucky as an office, I guess, that we've had similar experience. The Sultan Nazrin Shah Centre for Worcester College um, is a building built around um, a cricket a cricket table. There, I think the project team did some bespoke impact testing um, on the glazing prior to installation. At the Masters Field, we discussed very early on the technical parameters that the glazing needed to achieve, both with Sangaban and Shuko um, and Ali Craft, who were um, the subcontractors engaged in the project. We knew that we needed to specify a high impact glazing, particularly on the outer pane, um, and specified a toughened glass. I think they're secure it um, glazing. It's got a sort of five times the impact resistance of an annealed float glass that the inner pane um, was in. Um, I think in full transparency, I do realize in the last month or so, there's maybe been um, a cricket ball like dent one of the windows um, on one of the, the northern blocks. We were assured by the college when we commenced this project that no one was that good at cricket, that they'd ever hit a four <laughs> or a six. Um, I don't I don't watch cricket, so I'm not entirely sure um, what's, what's the better of the two. Um, but clearly they've, they've improved over the course of, um, of this project. But um, yeah, the, the glazing that was specified um, if it, if it isn't dented or um, breaks, it breaks into safety shards and not shatter. Um, and that was that was definitely part of the, the performance specification initially. Well, you're talking to the wrong person because I haven't got a clue about <laughs> cricket either, but I think we will move on to talking about other aspects of architecture. And uh, we're going to bring the rest of our panel back in now, please. Sounds good. Um, we, We've had a lot of interesting questions and I was interested, there's a couple of questions um, that came in from Murray um, to do with the perforated screens. And then there was a question for Holly um, about some of the decorative elements. And I'm going to put those together because I think they are um, interesting. Um, so with Murray, it was, how did you ensure that the perforated screens provided enough shading to prevent overheating due to low angle western or evening sunlight plus how do you expect the perforated screens to weather over the years and will they corrode and also is there any figures regarding the embodied carbon of the envelope of the perforated screens and finally were there any acoustic issues with those screens uh, due to wind effects so, wind effects, weathering, uh, embodied carbon, how are they going to last? That's quite a lot all around those perforated screens. Yeah, I, I, I would try my best to answer those as best I can. They, the, um, in terms of the weathering, it's quite straightforward. They, they're aluminium sheets and they're poly, uh, PPC coated, and, and that, that is um, a, a pretty good solution for um, uh, for, for weathering uh, a metal panel. Um, uh, in terms of wind noise, that actually was tested. Um, uh, we had two uh, large-scale one-to-one mock-ups, um, and so uh, a Bay study complete. Um, uh, with glazing balcony and and that um, aluminium perforated, perforated pattern were, were tested uh, 
on a number of different criteria, uh, you know, rain, wind, um, uh, etc. So uh, that was taken into consideration. Um, to be honest, in terms of the solar, um, uh, you know, quality, the solar shading quality of that screen, um, uh, honestly, it, it uh, there, there were no significant, there, there were no specific calculations that, that were were carried out, um, and really, it was the the, the design of the facade um, uh, assumed that those panels weren't there actually. So uh, they were there as a benefit, an additional benefit um, to uh, to the facade, um, uh, and um, uh, and and so. Um, they're there, uh, to be honest, more decoratively uh, to create a feature rather than uh, there being uh, there is an additional solar shading in addition because you have the overhanging balconies and the quality of the double glaze unit um, that was sufficient. Um, I I don't actually have any uh, uh, of the data on um, uh, the sort of carbon uh, emissions. I'm afraid to hand. I think that's all right. Um, but I think it's interesting because we also had um, a question for Holly, uh, also on a sort of decorative um, element. It, it was about that basket work um, decoration and whether it was going to need a special cleaning regime if it was going to continue to look good over time. Yeah, it seems to be weathering okay actually on site. We definitely, for our exposed precast elements, applied a pre weathering treatment to um, all precast elements um, and the brickwork at low level, mainly as a sort of anti graffiti um, situation. But at the moment, it seems to be um, it seems to be weathering weathering okay. I mean, time will tell. I think there were definitely concerns at the outset of developing something with a high intricacy and um, surface relief, like how would that weather, particularly in a landscape um, that is so heavily planted and, and tree lined. But um, some of the early buildings have been in occupation um, and were built four years ago now. And um, yeah, they're uh, uniformity of the the color um, seems to seems to be maintained it was really interesting to see when you gave us a glimpse of your earlier projects um the fact that you were using decorative elements on so many of them and then of course you know we saw we saw murray's project um and from what he was saying about consistency and things you know obviously this is something i know that square and partners has done and then you know, to look back to um, the Barbara Rice project and thinking, well, actually, all that decoration and articulation is kind of there already in that preserved facade. But of course, when you go to the back, um, you do see that rather wonderful um, ribbed brick wall, which again is giving you a bit of visual interest. Is this the way that um, one actually distinguishes uh, residential projects. Does, does one need some of that to go in there? Otherwise, dare I say it, there's a danger that however well considered, they might all look a bit the same. I'll pose that as a philosophical question. I'm very glad that you are uh, picking up on that because uh, I grew up with the very much uh, with the Lawsian uh, ornament is crime uh, uh, kind of background and I, I do have a problem with the more and more sort of stuck on ornament which is all machine made so it's sort of lost its uh, its roots of the art, uh, uh, artisans making things beautifully and now it, there seems to be very much a stuck on uh, decoration trend that's going on and some of it I think is more successful than than other bits um, but uh, we personally try and use um, uh, sort of more more modest ways of, of relieving uh, big surfaces, such as using the bricks themselves um, to speak rather than applying things. Uh, I think there is a big conversation, of course, because historic buildings with beautiful cornices and beautiful um, skirtings and so on are still very... Uh, appealing, but I'm not sure that in 2020 one should be resorting to 
um, sort of putting pastiche decoration onto buildings? Um, there's setting your stall out. Um, <laughs> Murray, let me come back to you. Um, I don't necessarily agree with everything that, that Barbara said. I, I think decoration <laughs> is not dead. Um, I think uh, decoration um, using um, modern technology could be considered just as craft um, as perhaps um, somebody carving a bit of, uh, of stone 200 years ago. I, I think um, there are lots and lots of uh, lovely ways of, uh, uh, of, of representing perhaps the history of a site, its location through decoration. Um, and um, we sort of um, dive headlong into uh, decorating our buildings um, uh, as much as we can. Holly, you know, one of one of the projects that you showed very briefly was in the um, former athletes village where there was an awful lot of accommodation going up very fast, wasn't there? And there really was a need to differentiate one building from another. Yeah, absolutely. And there, I think you have a, a, a set footprint that you have to work within. And it is a project about an envelope um, and defining that envelope that meets a series of functions, both in its uh, original life um, within the Olympics and then its legacy um, onwards life. I think we would sort of align um, more closely to Marie's position in terms of decoration. We certainly advocate for using the craftsperson wherever possible and on the master's field. You know, we worked with specialist joiners um, to make bespoke pieces of furniture that also complement aspects of the facade tectonic that were machine led. But their origins, I guess, the uh, of the motif, the woven motif was something that was worked through um, by the architectural team here, um, involved a lot of um, drawing, drafts, drafting, complex 3D modeling and geometries, um, working with samples and mock-ups with the specialists in their field, both the precasters, the main contractor, um, the people involved in making the resin molds for the negative um, and that aspect of collaboration and communicating about how we can deliver some of these highly articulated refined pieces we think still maintains those sort of early origins of, of, of craftsmanship and, and working through um, we certainly wouldn't want it to just be um, an applied afterthought um, it, it's about how can we sort of use modern technology and modern skills um, to advance some of these these ideas and themes. Well, there obviously, <laughs> obviously are different ideas on decoration, although in this case we have seen three incredibly successful projects. But something that I think we'll all agree on in terms of appearance <laughs> is when we look at the first images of those uh, buildings in Marylebone before uh, the architects got to work, and we're not talking about decoration, we're talking about crud. We're talking about a lot of sort of pipes and protuberances, and we're talking about um, sort of funny little glazed roofs. And I'm going to ask Carl, how did you actually get rid of all that? Because presumably a lot of it was serving a purpose, uh, albeit not right. very well and in a very hideous manner. We had uh, a lot of plant equipment which served the ground floor retail units and that was refrigerant units, AC and, and so forth. And this had just been accumulating over time in a haphazard manner, no uh, uh, acoustic treatment to it and also um, kitchen extracts that, that sort of snaked up the building. And one of the first moves we made was to create an interstitial zone, which was about 600 mil uh, in height off the existing rear roofs and we created the courtyard above that. And what that gave us, that gave the flexibility for changing retailers and, and so forth to, to be able to plant their paths and so uh, to, to get to a dedicated space at the rear of the courtyard, which was a, a purpose-made acoustic enclosure. And we worked with a fabulous uh, acoustic uh, company, um, well, enclosure company called MTech. Who, uh, who had a, a, a tried and tested uh, acoustic enclosure that, that could take all of this equipment. And then we did further testing with them to apply all the uh, timber surrounds and so forth so that it, it, it actually sat as an object in the, in the rear landscape. 
fascinating, not the most glamorous, but certainly one of the most important <laughs> elements of the project. I've also had a question, which I think has come in directed at Holly, but as our last question, probably, I'm going to direct it to each of our speakers. And this was around <laughs> prototyping and how much time you spent on prototyping. And I suppose let's widen it out a bit. Um, everybody would love to prototype everything, um, but how do you actually find the time and the money and the patience from your client? And I think we'll talk about this in relation to the specific projects we've talked about here. So Holly, if you could just tell us kind of how that worked. I totally agree. And I think now we see with technical challenges to do with fire legislation and so on, that there's more of a demand for any bespoke elements of construction to be tested. And that requires an investment from the client and the project team, both time and program to, to make that happen. We're also always really keen in our specifications and contract documents to write in an allowance for mock-ups, um, both for benchmarking and sign-off uh, for the client, but also to work through some of these technical aspects. We certainly did that on the master's field and a, a, a pocket of money was set aside. Um, set aside for that. Um, there are obviously areas where it, it is a process of trial trial and error once you bring on the specialists, the subcontractors and the main contractor team to make that work um, and then using in-house acquired knowledge um, on, on previous projects. Um, but yeah, we, we certainly always try to write into the specifications a need for certain things to be mock up um, and tested and early discussion with the client about the benefits of that, showing them examples is often how we secure that into, into the contract. Well, I'm sure that you would say, because everyone does on every project, that you know, if you'd only had a bit more money, you could have done a bit more. But uh, we all know that Oxbridge colleges are amongst the most generous of clients, and long may they remain so. I wonder, Murray, on a commercial residential development, albeit in an area where I know there's a great interest in uh, getting good architecture, how easy you found it to get the time and money for the prototyping? Um, actually, Argent were enormously supportive of uh, of building a mock up, and and uh, um, I, I I think that um, is almost true of most of our commercial uh, clients that they recognise the benefit of it. Yes, there is a cost, <clears throat> and it certainly needs to be built into the program, because in every case when we have built a mock up. I think something has changed um, in the final design as a result of it, um, and um, I, I, you know, we, we insist is probably maybe a slightly strong term, but but we 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 really do identify the benefits of um, that additional uh, spend from the client to to build a one-to-one -one mock-up. They are beneficial not only to us but certainly to the subcontractor. And we'll go back to Barbara and Carl. Uh, I mean, this project, you know, it's, it's wonderful to see how you have unpicked it and recreated it and, and made such wonderful spaces. Um, it must have been from the be at the beginning almost impossible for anyone to kind of grasp what you were going to do. And there must have been a lot of discussion to have. And as I said, earlier you know it was incredibly ambitious incredibly complex and i just wonder how much you did uh in terms of mock-ups and things and how sympathetic your client was to that because every every slowdown is um it's a bit longer until you get a tenant in isn't it dorrington are fantastic clients and i think uh, a lot of uh um, London architects have had the pleasure of working with them. They're certainly always aiming for a, a, a very beautiful end product. So they were very supportive. I must say, when I first went to site, my, my heart sank because I myself couldn't imagine what we could, what could we do with something as derelict and, and uh, unappealing as that rear courtyard. Um, our prototypes tend to be mostly um, materials comparing quite small things so nothing like the big panels that uh, the other participants were looking at but it's it's getting samples of materials to see whether they work well with other ones that uh, um, they will be next to and so on and, and i must say 
one of the only element that I haven't been happy with is one that we didn't get a prototype. So <laughs> I absolutely will insist next time, which was a handrail, which turned out to be a few millimeters too thick. And it really bothers me every time I look at it. So I, I would really encourage people to put money aside for uh, prototyping absolutely everything. Well, I'm so glad that you actually told us what it was. I was going to ask you to spill the beans and thought, I hope she will. Um, I'd like to thank all our uh, participants, our speakers very much for speaking. And of course, congratulate you as well on uh, winning these awards. And thank Shuko, who are our programme partner, but of course also uh, made the awards happen. Uh, otherwise, none of us would be here. I'd like to thank our audience for watching and for the questions that you all sent in. Uh, I found it fascinating. I hope you all have as well. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you all at a future event. Thank you very much indeed.